Are you on screen share? Let's party. Good to go. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. I um, This is obviously the worst thing that can happen, right? <laughs> is uh, what, what are you going to say when people leave the room is like, yikes. Um, so today I, I want to cover and forgive the Adobe pun, um, but kind of just the essentials of public speaking and presentations, some of the classic issues that come up and then what the pro settings um, potentially are along these lines. So as far as essentials, this is my favorite. I do have an unfair advantage in the world in that my sister is a linguist um, and very memorably she came home from university one day describing that all she was studying was meat science. So when we talk about mind over meat, the biggest one of those is um, obviously. And so um and ah, uh, understanding the mechanics of that uh, is really important to be able to stop yourself from doing it or to understand why it happens. And it is when your meat moves before your mind is ready. So if you find yourself umming and ahhing a lot to the point that it distracts your audience or it distracts yourself, uh, then this is a way that you can, and I just did it then, be aware of what's happening. So allowing yourself the grace for time to think is quite important so that you can react thoughtfully and make sure that your thoughts have time to catch up before your meat moves. As far as meat goes, there is another very important factor that takes more practice and a little bit more awareness, which I would suggest not practicing as much as uh, the British Conservative Party did that one year that they were all standing super weird at their convention. Uh, but you want to project confidence. You want to be engaged with your own content. Um, particularly when there are men involved, do not put your hands in your pockets because whatever you're fidgeting with, it doesn't look good. Uh, and that kind of goes for everyone, but just to be aware of. There are a few ticks and tricks uh, to, to kind of just say, how am I in the space? And does this affect the receipt of the content? So if you need to take notes, the notes app is useful, but when you start reading from it, it becomes problematic and distracting again with the hands in the pocket and the weird power stance. Uh, so there's a few kind of layers to just think about how you're interacting with a screen, how engaging you are. If you think that it's like it's more than 70% of our communication is nonverbal. So when you're on a screen like this, you may need to overdo it a little, the bold lips help. Uh, but also in person to not over emote, but to interact with the content, to be dynamic and engaging involves movement. Uh, so being too stiff, being over dramatic, it's really hard to find a middle place that you may need to practice and, and to find your voice. But these are some easy ones to avoid. Of course, this is nightmare scenario. <laughs> so, you know, and when you start seeing this happen, you can always, in pretty much any situation, and I'll come to the noddies later, uh, but having a friend in the room, someone to say, you know, speed up, slow down, uh, or you're doing great is really helpful, uh, even in just a, you know, an in-house design crit or presentation so that people who have to be there uh, still have something to take away from it. Of course, when you Google bad PowerPoint slide, this is the first result. Um, and it's, I think, a really exceptional example of what not to do. But there's a really great TED talk uh, that I'd recommend on the bottom here, and I'll, I'll share the links afterwards to these kinds of things. But basically, we, we don't in business ever put enough effort into presentation. The opposite occurs in design, where sometimes we put too much effort into presentation and lose the message through creating beautiful content. And so if you think about respecting what's meant to be happening as the foundation for how you present, how you prepare content, and then how you behave in the room, be it physical or virtual. This is an interesting example I wanted to share from some of my own work that is a hybrid report presentation, which I think we tend to do a fair bit in the industry. So I wanted to share sometimes 
you need to create content that does both, that you need to present it and that people need to read it later and it becomes a document of record. So having things like big headings that allow people to vaguely understand the proportion of what's happening on this page, no one needs to read the small words until they come back and want to read it later. There's also storytelling with consistent colouring, with crimes against data visualisation, like this uh, hybrid chart thing that I invented uh, for fun, you know, how to break down the information into understandable chunks so that rather than having 10 charts on this page, there can just be the one that tells you the story. And if you want to dig into the data, you can look at more and more layers of this content. But overall, it's kind of just there. And then this crime against graphic design, uh, which I, I really love, in that, again, you can read as much or as little of this as you want. So when presenting to an executive who really only wants to see what they've said written in bold, this is easy. For someone who wants more and more layers, they can read the bold text, the highlighted text, or all the text. I do, as we're going through this, wanted to demonstrate one other thing in that these slides are all from the same deck which is anyone having this reaction to the way that those slides are misaligned? That is obviously a huge problem, particularly when we're presenting plans um, or any kind of documentation or design updates, that if you're making people seasick by a slight misalignment, that will take away 90% of their focus from what you're actually trying to say. They'll just be itching to fix your slides. Um, so that's an interesting one to, to kind of flag. And at the opposite end of the slides that I present, keeping it simple so that people can read something, but also that you can talk to it. This is a slide where I actually talk through all five points and color in what they mean. And then there's a pair to that, which drops away one of them, which allows me to tell the story. So being simple and clear, and you know, when I do this, it's normally like a fully blank page um, so that it allows the message uh, it gives people a break from when I'm overwhelming them with pictures of people being seasick, uh, but also, you know, allows you to actually listen to what I'm saying and to think about how it connects to, to your business. Another slide that I use, so this is all the places that I have lived in green and worked in black. No one needs the labels. You get the idea. You don't have to overdo the content, especially when you just, you know, this is a two second slide that says, this is where I've been, lots of places. It's fine. Um, if I want to talk about particular markets or things, then we can go into detail. This is another slide that I'm presenting in a couple of weeks. This is it. This is the whole slide. <laughs> There's obviously a story to that and it's part of something else, but you really don't need to over egg it and overwork things, particularly when it comes to presenting content. There's This next slide is one of my favourites. <laughs> this is how I explain Australia to other places. When we're talking about the future of work, then I say Australia is 10 to 15 years ahead of everywhere else. And people, particularly in America, don't believe me, but we are an advanced, developed, educated economy of scale that no one cares about. It's simple, it's catchy, it's true, it's just mildly offensive in kind of a fun way that captures the attention, conveys my way of communicating, and can make everyone in the room feel comfortable with discussing something that is not necessarily aligned with what they thought three seconds ago. So when you're talking particularly about the future and about design, and you can state some things um, in a way that helps people recalibrate their thinking uh, toward being more accepting of what you're saying. As far as that goes, you know, this is one of my favorite slides. A client once asked me, you know, what are the 10 things I have to do to make a good office? Why do I have to talk to my employees? Obviously specific to what I'm doing, but I thought about it. I actually appreciated that that comment from, from him and went, went away and said, okay, well, here's, if you did four or five of these things, you'd end up with a perfectly adequate 2010s office. Is that the goal? Then the answer is usually no, but also for a lot of business people, for a lot of our clients, this is where they're at. This is what's in Forbes and Fast Company. You know, the conversation as far as what to develop next is not necessarily there. And so, again, with the blank space, you can say, we need to color these in. 
this is this is a work in progress as an industry. And so you can present unfinished content in this kind of way. And even, you know, there were more question marks when I started working with this slide that has slowly had content added to it. And I think some of these are actually going to fall off and my future predictions uh, are not going to be aligned with reality. But I think that conversation can be quite important and allowing people to feel that they can contribute. So coming to that, allowing people to contribute in, in classic mode, we're trained to be critical, specifically in architecture and design, but also generally. How often do you walk away from an experience, be it, you know, at the theatre or a business presentation or, you know, anything, and you, you, you can list the 15 ways that that was shit. That's really easy. But it's really hard to constructively think about how you would do it differently or how, you know, what you would tell them to improve. In architecture and design as well, whenever we're presenting, it feels like teamwork to say, here are the things that you can improve, especially when it's within your own firm or your own team. And I think kind of these, um, these ideas from about this kind of, they called it the, the, pool, the pool rules. Yeah, from foolproof. Sorry, that's a bit of a tongue twister there. But talking about how, what good critique is and what it means. And so... This is, you know, a little bit above and beyond public speaking and presentations, but in crits, the saying helping other people reflect so that they can identify ways to improve their work. It's not going into a room to problem solve for someone else, but to build on their ideas. And I think there's something really interesting within that from the speaking perspective, but also more generally in our practice. Say, what do we want <laughs> in any experience? And what do we want when we're engaging with people? And what do we want as a speaker? And you want people to be engaged. You want them to have ideas and give them to you in a way that is not problem solving for you, but building something together. There's also another problem generally in design. And I've got to say the Google search results for this were better than I expected, more diverse than I expected. When you type in design director or creative director, this is who you're getting right? This is the vibe. It used to be all men. It's not anymore. That's exciting. But these people are dramatic. They're pretty. They, you know, they have charisma, I guess, um, or at least someone took a really good photo. And, you know, we, sometimes it can feel particularly as a young designer to stand up in front of some of these people and go, oh, my ideas are going to change the world. Really difficult to compete, to feel that you can talk to people as peers, to feel that you can make an impression. Um, I think knowing that at least 50% of this is staging <laughs> is helpful. Uh, but even, you know, within the dynamics of a business, you know, of a firm in particular, um, of the experience and talent that other people have, knowing that you wouldn't be in the room without talent, I think is something that we we all need to reflect a little more on. But also, Building forward and taking the opportunities to learn doesn't mean making yourself smaller. So I think a good old Liz and Molly, as far as do we want to grow up to look like that black and white page of men or are we going to draw stars and sit a little outside the box, is that that comes into not only how we see ourselves but also how we present figuratively and, and literally. And so... In any conversation, in any presentation, you have the opportunity to demonstrate your personality, your creative capacity, and your career plans. <laughs> if you say, I'm going to present, you know, that's something that, that some people uh, are not willing to do or don't want to do, and that's perfectly fine. But if you want to, and if you're in this room, you probably want to, then being just even stepping up to that is a really important mode switch to be able to say, I'm going to figure out what this means for me and how I speak. There's something, I love my, my headshot, one of those dramatic, moody, you know, low tone ones. But um, I, <laughs> the temptation to airbrush, <laughs> but that's not true. Because what I'm selling is this personality. There's, there's no hiding that. And so I might as well own it. And if you see me, if you see that picture, you get that I'm probably going to make 50 bad jokes within five minutes and I'm having a great time. And so you can join me there or not. 
uh, it's, you know, it's been an interesting journey as well, kind of at, you know, after 10 years in the industry to say, who am I <laughs> as compared to my mentors? And so there's a really interesting kind of thing to, to work through and whether you've already been through that or going through it or sense it might be coming up. Uh, and I suspect it's something that continues throughout life. But to say, if somebody wanted to hire my mentors, they would, if they want to hire me, that's what they're hiring. And so pretending to be someone else and trying to fill a behavior and a presentation and the shoes of someone else's mode is probably not to anyone's benefit. So while there's always opportunities to grow and learn and take on feedback, being aware of what that is and what it means and at the end of the day, what you're selling and in any context you are selling um, is quite important. So in the presentation, any kind of presentation from crits, client presentations, you know, public speaking panels, those sorts of things, the most important things from the audience perspective to answer is like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> so I hope it's clear what I'm trying to say today, but, you know, you can let me know at the end if it's not. But also what do I have to do about it? is most of the time in meetings, you know, there's been a lot of news recently about how expensive meetings are and we have too many and et cetera. If you just cut them out of your calendar, you get all this time back. We do actually need to meet to be productive and communicate, uh, schedule, plan, et cetera. But understanding in a meeting what is required of you as an audience member in a presentation, in a studio gathering, you know, if the CEO is in town, giving a presentation that's like mildly deathly boring, uh, then they're not doing a good job of explaining why you need to be there. And anytime that you're giving a presentation, you want to make sure that people know what they're meant to be getting and have the capacity to build into that. There's another problem that happens, and this is one to cut from the recording, is when the outline is too long, <laughs> sometimes because when we're particularly when we're working in design and we've got acres of work behind the scenes, we've got so much content, so much built up because I mean, we have to build a building. And so there's an enormous amount of depth and detail within that. Sometimes we over communicate on that. Sometimes we skip the detail altogether and just look at the big picture. Sometimes we put all of it in and try to kill people with PowerPoints that are too long. But also, we can spend a lot of time making pretty decks that are illegible or that are deathly boring. And so, you know, I just want to share, I had a had an opportunity last week to see a project manager present something, which is not usually the dynamic in which things happen. And so, you know, often we'll be presenting to them. They'll be part of a group that's making decisions on our, on the client's behalf within a project. Unfortunately, this person talked like a project manager and I know that what they were talking about was interesting, but I don't think the, the client does because they were talking about it like a project manager. <laughs> so coming back to kind of those earlier uh, comments and suggestions around presentation and behaviour is that if you are interested in the topic and sound like you're interested in the topic, then other people are more likely to be as well. I love this fun fact that more people die every year from accidents with left-handed people using right-handed implements than in shark attacks because life is dangerous enough. I just don't think we know enough about left-handed people to be able to let them loose. However, terrible PowerPoints are also just, you know, if, if I use the same theme all the way through this and the same fonts and the same sizing and the same setup, you would be asleep. You might be asleep now. I'm sorry. But there's, you can use ugly content. <laughs> you can make an impact and make a splash. And if this is your only takeaway from our talk today about left-handed people, I love that for you because there's something within the, con the content and the conversation that people can take away. At the end of the day, as an audience member, I don't know what you know. <laughs> which I think is really important when structuring for all of those contexts, for crits, for client presentations, for, you know, like 
award presentations, if you're trying to like present something to a panel, if you're on a panel, if you're speaking, you have so much more context. You have the full knowledge of the project, the full knowledge of what you've been researching to be able to pick and choose the components that are not only interesting to you, but that actually tell the story to me. <laughs> And as an audience member that I can piece it together in a way that isn't overwhelming in detail and underwhelming in spectacularness. Yeah, that's a great word. Um, I think that we, we kind of often miss that connection. And so using, I, I use my sister. Um, she's a lawyer. She has no visual capacity. Um, we'll cut that too. But she can tell me, I don't understand how you got from A to B, or I don't know why you're obsessed with that stair detail. I don't care. You just go, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm I'm working with the, with the full storyboard and I'm only be able to make you a trailer. What are you actually going to put in that trailer to make it compelling, to make you either want to read the full report or to approve it and, you know, go forward? In the pro section... There's a few things that I want to talk about, though. And the first one is obviously working in those global contexts. There's something uh, that happens in different places in that there's different business expectations and behaviours. And although I love this from our UCT Business Travel, great summary. We don't pay enough attention, I think, to the differences and diversities between cultures, between businesses, between industries, even within, I mean, the US is a big place, <laughs> it's a pretty diverse place and different cultures, even San Francisco, LA, right? I would dress differently for different meetings in those places. You behave differently. You have different presentation styles. You know, I really like particularly these ones. And, you know, I, I like the German one because what communication style is the norm? It's like, you know, just go to the target, but like to the point of bluntness, Oh, okay. So for me as an outsider to say, no, really, blunt is good. Um, that kind of context and nuance can be really important. And so if you have access to clients, if you're presenting to another studio on the other side of the country, uh, you can choose to be, like I often do, overtly Australian. That's fine. Not to the point of disrespectful, I would say, although sometimes that's needed. But being able to moderate your behaviour and understand the context in which you're talking is quite important. I think there's one that I particularly love um, that happens with British people. If I Sorry, I skipped this one. Yeah, British people, um, they hate it. They hate it when you take forever to get to the point, which I just wouldn't have thought of <laughs> because kind of in the, you know, we all, we're all familiar with Aristotle's three-act structure, right? That we get, you know, in any storytelling arc, get a couple of plot points, we're along for the ride. But if you think about this in the context of an hour-long meeting, um, no, I'm not waiting for the point. And I, I get where the British people are coming from because while it is exciting for me, who has the full picture, to be able to take you on a journey, they have emails to write and other places to be and families to tend to. And so you're like, okay, fine. I think this gets a little closer to where we are in terms of business as to like, have a hook, you know, build some rising insights, have a moment, move on to next steps. Also not going to fly in the UK. I'm just, I'm really pressing that point because they are quite different. <laughs> Instead, this is a little bit more of how we go in design. I think this is from IDEO around how the flow of our creative process works. Uh, one of the biggest insights in my master's was finding out that to business people, design thinking is a foreign concept. The idea of working toward a solution in creative lateral pathways, which is what we're all taught, right? <laughs> As like basic problem solving, that's alien. And I think when we're presenting, and that can happen even within our own firms, but particularly with clients, when we're presenting what we think is a linear process, it's probably not. It's probably quite alien. And so explaining the steps between A and Z and the loops that you've gone through and the processes of iterative development 
is really important to be able to explain to people how you got from the from go to woe. You know, I once had a principal. I was, you know, we were talking about how to use a building, and I said something. <laughs> Three weeks later, she came back to me and said, I've got it. We're going to do it this way. And the look on my face must have been spectacular because she said, is that what you've been trying to say for three weeks? It was yes, yes. I didn't do a good job of communicating because I was just trying to put a solution in front of her rather than explaining all of the steps that I'd gone through to get to that point. And I think that's particularly relevant in our industry to say there are so many different ways to skin a cat. How are you doing it? What steps have you gone through? And what kind of bag are you going to end up with at the end? There's other components to that as well, right? Subtly preempting questions. <laughs> so um, people never want to have their legs cut out from under them in a presentation. They, you might say something and they're sitting on a question and they really want to ask that question and it's just like stewing and brewing and they've written it down and they're getting ready and then you answer it before they have a chance that sucks if you're able to explain some some kind of core concepts to say this is how this is different to this other thing you might be comparing us to out of the gate so they never even have time to build up the anticipation for their question is usually you know a better option so thinking about where you want to preempt questions if you want your audience to be focused on something or not focused on something figuring out how to manage your message and then the the inverse of that is productively engaging with them involving with the pe the people that you're talking to in any conversation so sometimes that can be open questions it can be here's me talking for 20 minutes and then here's a question for you you know, are we on the right track? Are there additional things that you've been thinking about while I'm talking that you're like, oh no, we're completely different or we have this other key component to add into the mix. In presenting, you know, for client pitches, when they've had six architecture firms talking at them for an hour and then somebody asks them to draw pictures, that is quite memorable. Uh, and you already then get insights to begin preparing in a response rather than it just being a purely didactic engagement. So there's a number of interesting things to work through on that front. I love what Sarah has been doing this whole time. We love the noddies. <laughs> so organic noddies better than planted noddies. And I'll say that Sarah's noddies are not planted today. There's a thing that happens, particularly with politicians, when they stand up in front of the microphone and they have their, their crew behind them. And the crew all just look at them adoringly and they nod while they're talking. It's the best, right? It's the reinforcement that you need. Firstly, you know, in a conference context, when people are nodding, they've understood what you've said. You have talked in full sentences and made sense. And they either agree with it or they want to set you on fire. Both of those are good outcomes. Sometimes, particularly if you're nervous, ask a friend to be a noddy. Ask them to say, yeah, cool, this makes sense, or be like, I have no idea what's happening, because that feedback is kind of what you need to be able to be confident in what you're saying. To come to the rule of thirds, <laughs> this, this uh, insight um, was shared with me a couple of weeks ago, and I actually found it to be really, really useful in, in terms of, you know, a thousand person conference to say, a third of the audience will know more than you. And if you try and out-technical them, they're going to be annoyed and catch you. A third of the audience think they know more than you, and there's no fixing that. And a third of the audience want to learn. Everyone has chosen to be in a room, generally. Sometimes not with in-house pitches, but generally people want to be there. And talking to the people who want to be there is the best bet. So if, if the first group think that you're a peer, and the third group have something to take away, that's the, that's the target audience, to be able to share what you know. I think, I hope everyone's familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect, is that you probably want to be somewhere on the slope of enlightenment in terms of your confidence to competence ratio. Um, we've all seen people speaking at the peak of Mount Stupid, and that's okay. It's part of the journey. Uh, and I think, you know, within the industry, there's a lot of 
systemic vested interest in keeping people in the valley of despair when they probably shouldn't be there. We can build up each other's confidence more, um, particularly as our competence grows. But kind of being aware of yourself, <laughs> of your experience, of your, your competence and confidence and the interrelation between those two things is quite important. I want to share with you, this is one of my absolute favourite graphics that I've ever made. I just, I've never, I was just, as I say, over 10 years trying to put the way that I think on a page, quite difficult, and communicate. I'm trying to explain to this client the interrelation of all of these factors and the way that I visualise their business operations. Does this look like it's an ad for the Barbie movie? A little bit. But it captures all of those components in a way where my visual spatial mind and their literal programming overlaps and interrelates. It can take a decade to figure out how to tell the story. <laughs> and that's okay because stewing and building on things is a really important part of development and communication and your growth. And so if you can't nail it the first 600 times, that's fine. You're never going to bat a thousand. <laughs> um, you might want to aim for more than, you know, one in 600, but it's being able to continually evolve your message and think the clarity with which you think to yourself about any issue and challenge and how you're going to express things. The more effort that you put into that, the more clear and capable you will be in expressing to others. I had someone recently ask me this question, which I was unprepared for. I don't think anyone's asked me this before. Coming back to how we're trained to be critical, and someone says, what would impress you? I took a beat. I genuinely had no idea how to respond to this. But in thinking about it a little bit, in any context, in design, in business, in speaking, in just the real world, these are the things that impress me, but not alone. You need thoughtfulness to impress me as well. And I think when it comes to thinking about if you did want to do professional speaking, uh, having each of these three components in your topic, my first question when people say, I want to be a speaker, how do I do it? What do you rant about at dinner parties? And does it hit all of these three questions, <laughs> these three components? Because if you're just ranting, if it's just passion, that's fine. But if it's thoughtful and constructive and comes from a place of having put more thought into it than others potentially, then that's where some interesting things start happening. That's where if you're building a constructive conversation with people, then you have something to share. In the way that we talk about design, if we're just so you can do a toilet block, right? You might think a toilet block is a toilet block. <laughs> that's, that's it. Or it can be the Mona Lisa. It's nuanced and creative and designed around all of the same components that go into some Calatrava bridge that costs way too much, that changes people's lives, right? If it's accessible in all of the things that that means, if it is pushing boundaries in ways where you have solved the tiniest detail in the most beautiful way, that's passion, enthusiasm, and thoughtfulness. And people will listen to you at a dinner party talk about that toilet block. And I think when you find that component, it becomes really easy to then share that in a broader context, but also just in the way that when you're presenting to say, I absolutely nailed that or our team bollocks that up beyond belief. And what we learn from that mistake is these things. And it just, I think that, uh, component of, of the message is quite important. I know I've said that a lot because this is the crux of it, right? Back to Liz and Molly. This is the difference in how to get up in front of a room, <laughs> be that within the office, in front of a client. If you say to your, your team lead, say, I want to present to the client. I want to get practice doing this. They will find you a client with whom you can do it. Or they'll say, I think we should practice in-house a little bit first. Great. 
people don't know what you don't tell them, <laughs> basically. And so this conversation about from where you are to where you want to be in any of these contexts is about believing in yourself, understanding the context and asking for help. And so that's where I'm at as far as a presentation. Do we want to jump to questions? Yeah, does, um, I don't know if anyone has any specific questions. Um, Kate, you have clearly heard me talk about uh, toilets too much. Uh, <laughs> It genuinely wasn't about you. I realized it halfway through talking <laughs> that I do know someone who designed an awesome toilet block. Like what are, what are the odds? What are the odds? Um, what are your thoughts on the, um, I was, oh gosh, I think it, I think it was probably on TikTok. The, um, the Apple hand gestures, when you, uh, brought up your, it was at the very beginning of your presentation. It was like, you know, how oh, you no, I know, I know exactly which hand gestures you're talking about. I think as soon as you learn to wave like the queen, you've put too much thought into it. And that's where, uh, you know, fidgeting is I actually, one of the reasons that I keep my nails kind of long is so that I can fidget with them in a way that is not distracting to people that are watching me. Genius. You can do that in a minute. So I'm not fidgeting with a pen. I'm not tapping on the table. If someone taps on the table, I might kill them. And <laughs> You know, there's all of these things that you can use and practice. There's whole, like you can do a whole course in breath work and, you know, presence and calmness and whatever. Um, it's finding out how to stop your meat moving before your mind does is an important one. But also just whatever tips and tricks you need, when it becomes overthought and overwrought, it becomes obvious to the audience. So you're now forevermore, all of you, if you see me speaking, will see me fidgeting with my fingernails and get annoyed by it. But usually it's subtle enough that it's not a problem. I know um, in high school, I had a phenomenal speech teacher and um, he, we had a list of words on the back wall, the, the ums, ahs, uh, you know, all of those. And anytime someone said one of those in their speech, they, someone in the audience dropped a marble into a tin can and it just took you completely out of your speech so that you had to get, you know, your mind catching up with your meat. It gave you that uh, enough of a pause to mm -hmm. be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and Fun it twisters are also good. Pretty well. yeah. <laughs> Taking the practice to think about how the meat moves um, is quite important to then just say, oh, have I, have I spent enough time on this? Do I, can I say, what was it? Full proof, proof, full, like pull <laughs> rules. Wow. <laughs> um, there's, there's always layers to what's going on in your mind at any given time. And obviously there's a, I'll say neurospicy layer to that as well as for example, <laughs> you know, cause I, have ADHD I can't be like reading a script but also I don't want to forget things that I've said I have literally next to my screen the chapter headings that tells me what I plan to say because I know when I put all of this together for you all what I was planning but do I necessarily remember that as I'm going through it no <laughs> but I've got a support structure that means that I don't have to worry about that and waste time and energy on worrying the same as I've done a fair bit of practice around umming and ahhing to be able to not waste energy on that. It's only when I'm talking about it that I then notice that it becomes a problem. But yeah. Do you have a, I'm sorry, if anyone else has questions, please come show your faces. Let's hang out for a couple minutes. Come on. Um, do you have a favorite mm, client type that you like to present to? Are there like, sectors of clients that you I don't know prefer to present to over others maybe like designers versus lawyers you know that kind of thing it's not of an industry thing okay. it's a thoughtfulness thing so there are some people who want to have all the answers and there are some people who actually think when you ask them a question mm. I prefer the latter <laughs> it's, okay. especially people who repeat the company line as if it's like their original thoughts not my favorite mm, yeah no, uh, Rebecca. question i actually have 
like a million questions, but I'll, Go. I'll start with one. So I think a lot of your presentation t uh, alluded to in-person presentations. Um, and, you know, we talk, you talked about body language and then the naughties, nodders, naughties, mm -hmm. um, and things of that sort. And these days, I, I mean, I can't remember the last time I've, I've met with clients since the pandemic, but I haven't, I can't say I've done any client present, what I would call a presentation that wasn't over teams and mm -hmm. Sometimes people have their cameras on and sometimes they don't, but even when they do, it's not the same as being with, you know, the the body light, like the subtleties of people's body language is just doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't uh, transfer over Zoom as well as it does in real life. So I guess my question for you is how would you tweak some of the advice you have already given to us to those of us who are in my situation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. There's one of the things that, that came up as you're speaking is that I, so I do a lot of workshop facilitation and in-person workshops, you have them locked in a room. <laughs> so you have their attention. You can see if they're on their laptop and you ask them not to be. In a remote presentation, I think this applies to design and client presentations as well. I like to give people something to do while I'm presenting, be that a feedback form or instead of asking questions and normally we, you know, go around the table and people can contribute, have a spreadsheet that allows you to fill it out later <laughs> to think about it. So sometimes the content's actually better <laughs> because people have thought about it, but also giving people an activity because we're, we want in this scenario to be doing something else as well, right? We want to make the most of the situation. And so to get people's attention to share the content, if you pre-share like the slides, for example, people will skip ahead, super annoying. But if you're able to share incremental drops of places where they can provide comments, feedback, ideas, like the, the online whiteboard type tools to say, you know, through just throw some ideas on this, people will get distracted trying to figure out how to use whatever whiteboard tool it is. Like you can take that extra space that would otherwise be lost in attention to apply it back to the problem. And so that would be my main thing is that I actually, I don't mind anymore if I'm doing in-person or remote. I do prefer, you know, I had a, a law firm where like no one had their cameras on in the workshops. And I was like, is it just, am I just, is an empty room like is anyone listening I, mean, I can just like do my job with my tracks over here and you know at that point of the project honestly didn't matter but earlier when we were doing some in-person and some remote to say no this matters that you're engaged I need to know if you look confused <laughs> and I would say that at the beginning to say, I actually want to see your reactions so that I can gauge the response because what I'm doing is designing a system to manipulate your emotions going forward. That's what workplace is, right? And so that it's quite important <laughs> that I understand your emotional reaction to things. So Such a great there's a little bit... Explain workplace. <laughs> I'm going there's to a little manipulate bit, you. Um, pardon? <laughs> I'm going to manipulate you. That's the point. That's all it, we're, no, we're manipulating ourselves. That's the point, right? Is that I want to make a space you want to be. You've got to tell me what you want in a space so that you want to be there. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and it becomes, does that answer your question a little, Rebecca, around yeah. like giving no, people? Totally. And actually, as you were saying it, I was recalling some of the recent um, remote meetings I've been in where they did invite us to participate in something and how that kept me engaged. For sure. Nice. Yeah. But I never put two and two together in that way. My, uh, often... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's, it's not a replacement for in-person. It's a completely different medium. And I think that, 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 that has been lost a little bit in the transition to say, oh, we're just going to do this online now. But it's, it's not just a meeting online. It's a completely different situation um, to prepare for and to engage in. So the presentations that you give, mine are a lot more report style than they used to be, or a lot more like this one with giant pictures and little words, because 
I want to talk around it and let you focus on something while you're probably also doing emails. Whereas <laughs> before, when I had you in the room, it would be more of an in-between and that you'd be, I'd be expecting you to read something more complex on the screen while I'm talking. So I think, yeah, just different modes. It's so funny because I, I'm in charge of setting up the lunch and learn presentations for my office and they're all virtual now. And the vendors, um, the, you know, the, the reps keep complaining to me that, you know, people aren't attending, you know, there's no lunch. So people aren't attending or they're not participating. So it was boring before. Yeah. Just had free lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a good one today, actually. <laughs> I mean, some of them aren't bad, you know, certain ones are more boring. I think the AIA ones tend to be more boring because they have to like get all that technical stuff in there. But I just... I'm thinking like they could learn a lot. They keep asking me, what do we have to do to change this? As if I have the answers. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to refer them to you. I'm going to be like, you should yeah, sure. <laughs> set up well, a workshop with Kate Dodd and she will help you tweak your performance because I can't compel people to drive in Los Angeles traffic to hear a presentation on, you know, exterior cladding. <laughs> I mean, I would entitle that how not to get sued and murder people yeah. like <laughs> for starters. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's complex. It's difficult. And I think that, yeah, people I mean, and they were always boring. So. <laughs> the lunch always helped, especially oh, lunch helped. like yeah. cookies also like <laughs> dessert. Like today I had really good lunch. Uh, Shaw Contract did a great job on providing lunch, <laughs> but, um, and also they were show, showing off their like AI and virtual tools. So it was interesting and it wasn't in the AI. <clears throat> um, so lunch was good, but I was like, where are the churros? If you're going to provide tacos, why are there also not churros? <laughs> so <laughs> <It's very demanding. laughs> Yeah. Anyone else have a question? With the lunch and learns the lunch half of that. You can't just do the learn because that just gets really boring really fast. I mean, I have some vendors that provide like DoorDash gift cards now yeah. as an incentive, but honestly, it doesn't work. I still get the same six people who show up to all the lunch and learns regardless of what, whether there's AI credit, lunch, you know, a raffled prize. Yeah. So it was hard. People are tired of it. And I'm seeing that kind of engagement in this programming with the AW A plus D. I'm actually changing it to all in person next year. Um, specifically because like tonight, I had almost 40 people sign up for this event. We had yeah. max 15 people in, in the event, which sucks because I think they missed out on a phenomenal presentation by one of my best friends. So I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, there's but something, yeah, there's something about um, the intentionality as well. So like one of the clubs, you know, that I'm in organizations I'm involved in, we have one meeting, weekly meetings and one a month is remote. And in that one, we get somewhere, someone from somewhere that we could not access in person. Yeah. Like this, <laughs> right. <laughs> Where, and that it's a different mode. We get different people, but it's, something that we couldn't do before the pandemic and so to say add that to the roster but then being explicit about that with members to say this is, yeah. this is what we're trying to do mm -hmm. yeah ronnie you're, ronnie, on you're on mute jesus okay i still haven't figured that part out um <laughs> so okay i have a question about people asking questions and the, the whole like rule of the thirds which i thought was really interesting um, I, I feel like I get a little nervous if people ask me questions that I really cannot answer, you know, like I'm stumped and I'm, I'm fine saying like, I don't know, but if you're presenting something, um, like, do you have any tips for sort of when you get put in the hot seat a little bit and you might not kind of know the right response or, or reaction? I think... You can always infill so that you have time to think with a response like Rebecca got earlier, that that's a great question. Uh, it's a really interesting and nuanced topic. And I think it would be worth going back to look uh, and see what the research says 
see what's updated out there before I come back to you with a fully thought through answer because I don't want to waste your time. Yeah, I knew you'd have something good. <laughs> because I know it it totally happens and whether it's something learn to that you say just... that in CA meetings. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> right, and it's the CA standard. <laughs> Yeah, there's more work to do. <laughs> or you can do what politicians do and answer the question that you wish they'd asked. Yeah. And just ignore their actual question. <laughs> no, please don't do that. That's awful. <laughs> what was that about the guttering detail? Here's the exterior cladding answer <laughs> that we've actually thought about. I am going to, so you all know, um, so there are a couple of you that I don't know on here. Um, paste in our event listing into the chat. Uh, we've got a couple more events coming up uh, for this year. Um, all good ones. Um, and we will, again, um, I think we're doing our September one in person. Um, and that's the one Ronnie is gonna be presenting. Um, so. Uh, come play just come play with us we have a lot of fun we we've been lucky in our panelists obviously kate is phenomenal and super awesome um our panelists for planning to start your own firm are also amazing and uh good friends of mine um so come hang out learn something new and we'll all enjoy learning something any, um, uh, any more questions? Anything that I missed? One question. Oh. Hi. Yep. Do you prefer people wait till the end of your presentation to ask questions or do you, is it okay if people ask them as you're going? Is there a thought on that? It depends. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, it's, it's one of the, sometimes like I'll get to it. If it's, if it's like today where I had a 3x structure. I was going to just talk through a whole bunch of things and let you know my thought process. And I'm very, I'm, I'm very conscious that that was a mess graphically and such, but that's the behind the scenes version. That's actually what goes into baking it. And so I was thinking about that and, and putting that together. So if there'd been a question in the middle that I wasn't going to address then absolutely but otherwise I'd be like okay hang on we're gonna we'll get to the end of the maybe there's further discussion to have if I'm giving a client presentation and it is not what they want questions early are good <laughs> so say so I and this happened a client said I did not understand this to be your scope and I was like <laughs> That's yeah. fascinating. Uh, <laughs> and to then to reset those expectations early so that I just didn't then waste 20 minutes of my <clears> life <throat> talking about something that they thought was wrong because I did actually need them to listen. Uh, so, yeah, it, it depends. <laughs> That's not really a good answer to that one. How did you end up finding your, like, presentation style? Because I imagine when... A presentation style like you had this evening versus like a client presentation you're always you and I imagine your client presentations include just as many fun anecdotes and laughing and jokes um how did how did you come into that I when I was a baby designer my first job was half-time receptionist half-time interior designer in a firm of six people. So I was the interior designer and I loved messing with people because these like big important people in suits would come in and get me to go and get them coffee. And then the meeting would start late when I returned with the tray of coffees <laughs> and they would be like, what's happening? I go, well, I'm ready to present now. And I, oh man, that's probably my, you know, super uh, villain origin story <laughs> is the dynamic of respecting everyone in the room from the receptionist through is, is really important to me within clients. And so if I can't say things, frankly, then that's not the right room for me to be in. Mm. 
if you know if they're not actually there to participate in the content and that's about understanding what I have to contribute um and kind of just being aware that if I pretended to be as I say professional (laughs) it's not very authentic (laughs) so I might as well have a good time and hope that everyone else does too (laughs) and say what happened and then at the at the end as I say the worst case is they're like yikes she was terrible (laughs) and I will have had a good time so (laughs) that is very fair I don't know if I could pull it off with HOK but (laughs) (laughs) I think most people have more personality than they give themselves credit for yeah but we spend a we we spend a lot of time getting it stamped out socially and professionally so And well, if your passion is guttering details, go to town. <laughs> Amazing. Like there's no, there's no, this thing is there's no wrong answer. There's no one way to be. So <clears throat> be who you are. Awesome. Well, are there any other questions um, this evening? Otherwise, enjoy your Thursday evening. <laughs> <laughs>